You're listening to Nightlight. Hello, Chris Klin here with another Christmas Nightlight podcast, which we're going to dive in deep to the Christmas story with David Karan. And once again, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2. I know last time I taught on chapter 2, the first half of it. And now I want to focus on the second yes. half. It's a very different story, however, though. It's in the same vein of the stories about the birth of Jesus, the origins of Jesus, but this kind of gives us a very different kind of perspective. This is the type of stories that will never make it into the Christmas pageant. Wow. These are the stories that will never be included if you go to see a stage performance where they're doing a Christmas play and they're showing the birth of Jesus. These are the stories that are almost uncomfortable for most readers because it seems so different and almost just completely out of place with the entire other narrative. I mean, we're talking about now we're going to read the story of the flight into Egypt, the massacre of the infants, and finally Jesus' settlement and upbringing in the town of Nazareth. And I guarantee you that these are not stories you will ever see in the Christmas pageant or the Christmas play. And they're usually the stories that are kind of swept underneath the carpet. Why is that? Because they're they're difficult stories to process. They're difficult stories to sit and handle and wrestle with. But these stories are a crucial part of the origins of Jesus. And they have serious questions to answer for us with regards to who Jesus is and our relationship with him. Just to go back, and once again, um, we, we do this every week. I've been doing it with my, with my class group. All these classes are up on Patreon. So if people want to dig deeper into these subjects than I am able to go to in the small time we have together, I encourage you to go check it out. But Jesus is given two very distinct names. He is given the name Jesus, and then he is given the name Emmanuel. Yes. Now the word Jesus is actually Yehosis. And what that basically means is Yahweh saves. Really? And so Jesus' name actually meant Yahweh saves. And he is given this name because he says he is the one who's supposed to save his people from his sins. I never knew that. And then he is given another name by the angel who said that his name is supposed to be Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel basically means um, El, which is the name for God, Elohim, and Imanu means with us. So the name means God with us. And so those were the two things that Jesus was called to be. He was called to be God, who was the savior of the world, and he was supposed to be God who was with us. Yes. Matthew presents these names, then Matthew presents these stories. These stories are supposed to help us to I, grab the identity of who Jesus is based upon the information that we know about him. These stories today that we're going to look into are really crucial to help us understand what it means for God to be with us. Right. Like, what does it mean that Jesus is now here in this world and a living, breathing presence at this moment in history. And so in order to understand it, we need to really get the depths of the story. And so I just want to ask everyone who's listening, just for a few minutes, take off those rose-colored glasses of our culture and of all the tinsels and the lights and the Christmas holidays and the greeting cards and the cartoons and everything. Just leave that all aside and allow me to try to explain just the the stories about the birth of Jesus in a context that they most likely would have been in. As I'm saying this, put yourself in the shoes of these people. So close your eyes if you need to, and just try to picture that you are Mary or Joseph in this story. Okay. So just imagine, all right, that you're Joseph. So you're a young father who has now had to adopt this spontaneously generated son. Okay. And now you're, you're, you have been tasked with the responsibility of caring for this child and his mother during a very turbulent time in the ancient world. The son is not yours. You had all sorts of questions about it. You know, it, it had the potential to bring shame towards you. And you can imagine the agony that you go through because this kind of betrothal 
would have been something that would have been ongoing for about five or six years. Wow. And so, of course, there's feelings of betrayal. There's feelings of emotional upheaval. And then the angel tells him, no, this is actually God's will. And so he accepts it, but it's not going to be easy. Right. That's in Joseph's shoes. Now, just imagine that you're in Mary's shoes, right? You're a pregnant Jewish teenager. Now, that's crazy on its own. Right. But you were worried for a while because you revealed it to your fiance and your fiance said, look, we're going to break the engagement. And in breaking the engagement would have left you destitute and alone. And if you decide to press charges against you, you could probably end up being executed. Gosh. So there was all that insecurity that was there, especially given with the fact that when you're pregnant, there is an upheaval of emotions and hormones. So you can imagine just how emotionally fragile Mary is during this time. That's right. But Joseph comes, the angel spoke to him, he works it out. And so that's a very intense situation, but you got through it. Okay, you got through that intense situation. And so you say, okay, at least now things will be okay. And then one day we'll look back and say, you know, remember the time when we first got together and this whole thing happened? Yeah, those were the days. But now things are fine. Right. Actually, things are not fine. Because right at that point, far away, some Roman politician, your conquerors, the people who invaded your homeland and made you serve their will for the past 70 years, the people who have been treating you lower than the dirt and who have been grinding you under their heel, decide at a whim that they're going to raise their taxes. And in order to make sure that they tax you properly, they're not going to tax you where you are. They want you to go back to your city of origin and to register yourself in the census so that way they can see your worth and they can see your family's generational worth so they can figure out how to tax you properly. Never mind that this isn't a cause and upheaval of an entire nation. Never mind that this is probably going to scatter the country and leave it in a place of disrepair and confusion for years to come. It doesn't matter. Taxes must be paid. And so you're now Mary, you're pregnant, very pregnant on the verge of giving birth. And now you have to make an 80 mile trip on the back of a donkey. Gosh. And there's no paved roads. You're traveling over arid wasteland. It's very hot. There's plenty of hills, there's plenty of bumps, and as you can imagine, it is an agonizingly painful trip for someone who is in this state. But somehow you make it, and you're there, and you're just hoping against hope that fine, we'll get registered, we'll do the census, we'll pay it, and then we'll be done. And then a few years from now, we'll look back and say, remember those days, we made that trip, we did that thing, phew, you know, thank God we never have to do that again but at least things are better now. Actually, they're not, because while waiting for the census to go on, Mary goes into labor. You're going into labor, and you're in this new place. You have no relatives around. There's no doctor. There's no midwife. There's no mom that you can call. Remember, she's, she's a young teenager. There's no mother she can call. There's no aunt that she can go to for anything. They have to look for the first place that they can find, but there's nowhere. That's right. There's no hospital. There's no hotel. There's no even a bed and breakfast, B&B, that they can go to. They end up in a barn or a cave. And Mary has to give birth there on the floor. Definitely not ideal circumstances. Definitely not ideal circumstances. And you can think about it. This is really rough stuff. And then suddenly you get some really strange people coming in to see your baby. You know, the wise men from the East, pretty cool. You know, they brought gifts and they brought gold and they brought cash. You know, it's good. You need that. At least that can put towards starting to build some sort of life. <laughs> That's right. Joseph, by this time, has probably had to start working because he needs support. Being a carpenter, he would have taken whatever job he could find. So they're trying to build some sort of a life while they're taking care of this. And they keep getting all sorts of random visitors you have the shepherds who keep coming in and wanting to hold the baby. And you're like, ah, you know, uh, please wash your hands. Uh, leave them alone. You know, infant mortality rate is one in four in this part of the world. Please. We're already living in a stable. It's bad enough. And then 
we're told that Jesus is born and we just automatically assume that it's this miraculous birth and Jesus was this miraculous child who was singing with angels and, you know, laid their cherub face with the halo around his head. But you've got to imagine that Jesus was like every other kid. You know, he cried, he peed, he pooped, he kept Mary up all night. It's really rough stuff. <laughs> and you can also imagine that Mary's labor was probably long and painful because generally first pregnancies and first labors always take a long time and they're some of the hardest ones to go through. Right. This is it. This is Jesus. This is God with us, everybody. This, this, this is God's son. What a world. How anticlimactic. It's been nothing but problematic since he first appeared. That's right. But Mary and Joseph had this baby and they say, okay, Yes, it was terrible. Yes, we had a difficult time. Yes, um, we had uncertainty about whether we'd be together. Yes, we had uncertainty about traveling all this way. Yes, we had the baby in horrible conditions. Yes, we're trying to build some sort of living for ourselves, but at least the worst is behind us. At least we can move on from here. And one day we'll stop and look back and say, okay, remember those circumstances? They weren't so bad. Life got better from that point. But actually it doesn't. So you're this young mother, and you're sleeping in the middle of the night with your baby beside you. Baby's finally asleep. It's a joyful moment for a mother. She can finally get some sleep, too. And you're awoken in the middle of the night to news that there are Roman soldiers marching from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And the reason why they're on their way is because they want to execute your baby. That little baby that's lying next to you has got a death sentence on its head. Imagine as a parent just how horrified and fearful you would be in that moment. Man, gosh. So you get up in the middle of the night, you throw everything possible into your small little bags, get back on the back of the donkey, and you flee across the desert. You make a trip of almost 500 kilometers across the desert in the heat going towards Egypt, most likely Alexandria in Egypt, which had a large Jewish community over there, but nobody you know. And the entire time when you're going there, you're worried that the soldiers are chasing you. You worry that at any moment that you stop, at any moment where you settle down for the night, it could be your baby's last. And then somewhere along the journey, you arrive there and you get news that the soldiers did come to town. And the soldiers did go through and the soldiers killed every single infant and toddler because they thought it was your son. Just imagine that weight on your head, knowing that multiple infants and babies, blood is running through the streets. It's not a very nice thing if you put yourself in Mary's shoes, what she's experiencing right now. That's right. What, what kind of emotion is she going through at this moment? What kind of prayers is she praying? But then she says, it's got to get better from here. Things have got to settle down. Things have got to be okay. And so after a few years, finally, it looks like they catch a break. Finally, it looks like things are working out. Finally, it looks like there is, you know, a silver lining in the clouds because Herod's dead. The man who swore to take your child's life is gone. Maybe now we can go back to Bethlehem. Maybe now we can go back to the place that we were setting up. Maybe now we can go back to the beginning of the business that um, Joseph was beginning to set up. And maybe we can start building at least a quiet and peaceful life for ourselves. Yes. They head back to Bethlehem and they find out, oh no, who is in Herod's place? It's his son. And his son is as bad as his father and has also vowed to carry on the same sentence. So you can't go back to Bethlehem. So what do you have to do? You have to go back the 80 mile detour to your home village in Nazareth, your tiny little village that only has about 500 people living there and everybody knows you and everybody knows your story and everybody knows all the misfortune that has followed you. And everybody knows that you were pregnant before you got married. And so you become a shame in the eyes of the community. And you become a shame 
in the eyes of the people around you. And your family and your son and all your resulting children after that are raised with the question of people gossiping about them and probably not respecting them because they consider them to be illegitimate. They consider Jesus, your child, to be an illegitimate child. That's God. So how are we feeling after this? If you think about it, it's not a very nice story. Right. It's a pretty terrible story, actually. There's a lot of difficulty and a lot of pain and a lot of tears and a lot of trauma in the story of this young family. And I know there's people listening to this who have come from difficult circumstances and have come from very difficult situations and scenarios. I would dare say that this particular story is right up there with some of the stories that you will hear of just the most traumatic series of events that happen one after the other with no break, with no end in sight, with nothing ever getting better. And so the question that you have to ask during this very difficult phase of life is, well, what's going on here? What's God doing in all of this mess? Right. Because it's so anticlimactic. It was like Jesus is coming into the world. Jesus is coming into the world. God is entering into human flesh. Boom. Welcome to a series of unfortunate events. That's right. When the angel told Mary, you are going to be the mother of the son of God, I don't think she ever thought that life was going to be as rough and as painful and as miserable as it turned out to be. But the angel told her, you are blessed. And God has called you to this honor. That's right. And then things, it seems like things start going wrong from one moment to the next. And I think if you and I were in Mary's circumstances, we would be asking this question. Where is God in all of this? Why doesn't he seem to care? Why is he not involved in our situation? Why isn't he doing anything? Why has he left us with all this problem? And this is questions that we ask ourselves at many points in our life. You're right. And these are questions that people all over the world ask themselves almost every day. God, where are you in moments where life goes wrong? Where are you when everything terrible seems to happen? And so Matthew includes these stories because I believe he wants us to wrestle with that question as well. And he gives us three promises and three fulfillments in these stories from the Old Testament played out in the life of Jesus that I think really helps to throw some light on that question that we all ask. Where is God when things are difficult? Where is God when it looks like the train is derailed and life has broken into pieces? Because a lot of people, they, they come to Christ under this myth of religious fulfillment. They come to the Lord thinking that now that I've gotten saved, everything should get better. And they don't implicitly say that, but the way they act kind of shows it that now that I have Jesus, life is going to go very well. And then bad things just naturally start happening. And it really tends to cause questions. Right. And if you've had times in your life where you've hit rock bottom and you have had very difficult things happen, I'm sure that these same questions would be coming up in your mind as well. Yes. And so what does Matthew tell us about this? How does Matthew explain these stories to us? And what can we get through looking at the traumatic circumstances of Jesus' infant life? And what does that tell us about this God who is with us? So let's, let's turn to the Bible. Could you please read Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15? It's night light. What a delight. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Okay, thank you. They have to flee. They have to get up in the middle of the night, and they have to go all the way across the desert to get to Egypt 
traveling those 500 kilometers, fleeing away. And at this point, you can imagine if you're just if you're reading it verbatim, you can stop at this point and think, well, yeah, well, God screwed that one up. I mean, fleeing into Egypt, like everyone running away, like what what's what's going on? Right. But Matthew already assumes that we're going to be thinking that. And Matthew says, well, actually, no, no, things are not gone wrong. No, things did not go off track. Things did not go awry. And then Matthew stops and asks us to think and says, can you think of a larger pattern? Okay. Have you ever heard of a story where God raised up a deliverer? But then there's some insecure, power-hungry, evil king who uses oppression and violence who tries to stop God's purposes. I wonder if you can think of a story like that. Can you think of a story like that? Oh, of course I can think about that. That's Moses and the children of Israel. Yes. Okay, well, what happens there? And so Matthew pulls up this prophecy. Matthew pulls up this very beautiful prophetic poem that was um, included in the prophet in the book of Hosea in chapter 11. And it said, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now, when reading the book of Matthew, there are multiple occasions. There's over 50 occasions where Matthew will tell a bit of the story and then he'll stop and then he'll dial back to something in the Old Testament scriptures and say, this connects to this. Now, in some of those occasions, they are actually direct prophecies, foretelling of what would come, but not all situations. Yes. Some situations are reflections upon stories, reflections upon poems, and reflections upon concepts of the greater picture and narrative of what God was trying to work in this world. Right. And so let's go back and pull up this passage because Hosea is there in our Bibles right now. So we're kind of blessed by that. So let's go back and read exactly what it says. Keeping one finger in Matthew, can you jump back to the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1 to 4? When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. This is a very beautiful poem that was written by Hosea like a prophecy from God towards Israel. He says that when Israel was a child... I called my child out of Egypt. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Exodus. And he says, I called them unto me, and I was to them as a father. And I bound myself to them with cords of love and with kindness. He says, I was, the, I was like the one who carried the child. I fed them. I took care of them. It's a very parental sort of language that God is using here through the prophet Hosea, talking about how much love and care he had for this nation of Israel, who he brought up out of infancy, trying to care for them and calling them to be his people and establishing them with so much love and so much care and so much grace. And yet they went astray and yet they, they um, disregarded the laws of God and yet they caused problems and yet they followed after other gods. And so why does Matthew pull up this particular passage and say, actually, this fits in with the story of Jesus. Yes, why? Well, what is the story of the Exodus, right? God calls the people and God delivers them from a power and evil ruler. The way he does it is he sends his deliverer, Moses, and then the Pharaoh doesn't like it. So the Pharaoh tries to get rid of Moses, doesn't work. God saves him. And then Moses, through God's power, we have the 10 plagues, and then they are delivered. And then God leads them to Mount Sinai, declares that they're his people, gives them the Sinai covenant, leads them into the promised land. What is Matthew doing here? There's something very, very interesting that Matthew is weaving through pulling this up. And actually, if you look at the story in the first couple of chapters of Matthew, you'll see it very closely parallels the story 
of Israel becoming a nation. Really? Right? And the story of Israel becoming a nation, first of all, they went from the land of Canaan, they went into Egypt, right, when Joseph was there. And then there was an oppressive king in power who ruled them under a rod of iron and then killed all the children to avoid the deliverer coming. And then God intervened, called his son out of the world, out of Egypt, led them to the foot of Mount Sinai. And then they wandered the desert for 40 years. And then they passed through the Jordan and entered into the promised land as his covenant people. And so if you look at the life of Jesus, what are the stories that Matthew includes about the life of Jesus in chapters two and three? His flight into Egypt. There's an oppressive king who rules under a rod of iron, who kills the children to stop the deliverer from coming. That's right. But then God eventually brings his son back out of Egypt. Jesus goes and gets baptized in the Jordan and then spends 40 days in the wilderness battling Satan and then enters back into the land of Israel, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven. So what is Matthew doing here by pulling up the story and this um, beautiful poetic prophetic poem from God about the infancy of the nation of Israel? And why is he tying it into the story of Jesus? Well, because there were so many prophecies of fulfillment that were connected to the nation of Israel. So many prophecies about salvation, so many prophecies about blessing, so many prophecies about hope, so many prophecies about what they would do. And God gave them the commission. He said, God says to them in the Sinai covenant, he says, the world is mine, but I'm choosing you to be my generation of priests so that through you, the blessing may come. And so in Jesus's life, what Matthew is showing us by these stories is that Jesus is that promised blessing. And through him fulfilling, almost kind of becoming the new Israel, he is now the one who carries forward the story of blessing and the story of hope and the story of promise and the story of salvation. That's true. This is what is being revealed in the life of Jesus. And so Matthew wants us to consider that. Matthew wants us to ponder that. Matthew wants us to reflect on that. And Matthew wants to say, look, what's happening now is terrible, right? It's not like God orchestrated and told Herod, okay, now go kill all the babies. If that's the viewpoint that you take, then that's, that, that's incorrect. And that's going to give you a very dark and oppressive view of God. No. Did God cause it to happen? No. But was God caught off guard by it? Was he surprised by it? Did it throw all his plans off? No, because even in this terrible thing that is happening, even though in this moment, it looks like things have gone so poorly, Matthew invites us to step away from the story and says, no, the plan is still on track. And even though terrible things are happening right now, this all still fulfills God's plan. And God is still working to bring Jesus as the hope and the blessing and as the fulfillment of all these promises. That's right. And so that's what Matthew means by giving us that particular part. Then we get to the next part of the story. Do you want to read verse 16? Shining bright in the dark night, you're listening to Nightlight. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Okay, thanks. So here's what happens. So Herod realizes that the wise men have gone a different way. And he sees that they not come back. And Herod loses it. And as we've already seen before, Herod has this potential. When he loses it, people die. Yes. And it doesn't matter who they are, someone is going to die. And so Herod orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding area who are under the age of two. Now, from us 
looking at uh, anthropological records wow. and looking at the size of the populations and the size of the capacity of Bethlehem at that time and the areas around it. Archaeologists assume and historians assume that between 25 to 50 babies were killed that night. That's a horrible, horrible thing. That's absolutely horrifying. Horrific. And if you're Mary fleeing to Egypt on the back of a donkey and you hear this news, just imagine how crushing it is. Just imagine how just so painful it is to hear this. And not just for her, but also for all the people there in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas. You know, baby is, is like the, they call them the parents' greatest joy. And that joy is gone in a minute, snuffed out. And it's just a terrible, terrible tragedy. And you look at it now and you say, okay, fine. If the previous thing, you know, showed that God left and abandoned, fine. But if this happens, if he actually can look at stuff like this, it's a, it's a proof that he doesn't exist. What's going on? You know, something's really, really wrong over here. Surely God's not involved with this. Surely he doesn't have anything to say on this. Surely this cannot be his will. What does Matthew do? Matthew comes along and invites us to consider a different option. That even though this is their horrendous evil is being done, he wants to show us a different angle. So what does he do? He goes and quotes from the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet of Israel who predated uh, Jesus by about 600 years. He was witness to the most tragic and traumatic event in Israel's history, which was the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile into Babylon. The empire of Babylon came around the 6th century BC, besieged the city, and after about a year, finally broke through the walls, went through the city, killed hundreds and hundreds of people, burned the city to the ground, burned the temple to the ground, looted all the wealth from it, and then assembled all the survivors of Jerusalem a little bit south of the city in a place called Rama, which is next door to Bethlehem, chained them all up and took them on a thousand mile trek all the way to Babylon to live in slavery. It was the most traumatic event that had ever happened to Israel as a nation since they became a sovereign nation. Yes. And Jeremiah watched this took place. And much of the book of Jeremiah is him foreseeing this event and trying desperately to get people to change their ways and prophesying and telling them to do something different and telling them that they needed to get things right and being completely ignored and not just ignored, but persecuted for it. And then the rest of the book of Jeremiah is him looking at this experience and mourning about it. That's right. And just mourning about how terrible it is that this horrible thing has come to pass. And that's what this poem, this prophetic poem that Matthew quotes is about. So let's quickly turn to the book of Jeremiah, because I think we need to read this poem to fully get the beauty out of it. So let's flip to Jeremiah chapter 31. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children, because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. So here's what's happening. This is the passage that he quotes. So they're in a place of great difficulty. Jeremiah is over there watching the city burning and watching the people being marched off to Babylon as slaves, he says that there is a voice in Rama, which is tears and great weeping and lamentation. And it's like Rachel weeping for her children. It's the sound of the captives crying as they're being led away. And it's the sound of the agonies of the dead and the dying in the area, that place of Rama. In this terrible scene, Jeremiah still gives a prophecy of hope. And says, even in all of this, God has not abandoned us. Even in all of this, he is still going to work his will. Yes. Even in all of this, God will hold true to his promise because he doesn't break his promises. He promised that 
through this nation there would come a blessing he promised that through this nation there would be hope he promised that through the line of abraham salvation would come into this world right and so he looks forward and says god is even though things are such a big mess right now god will one day dry those tears and god will one day stop the weeping and god will one day work in this world to fix it the he uses the illustration the tears of rachel now, what does he mean by the tears of Rachel? Well, Rachel holds like this kind of very iconic place in the biblical imagination. She was the wife of the patriarch of Israel. She was the wife of Jacob, whose name became Israel, who was the founder of the nation of Israel. His 12 sons became the 12 tribes. Rachel was his favorite wife, the one that he loved, the one that he cared for, the one that he treasured. You can read her story in the book of Genesis. And so if Jacob is considered to be the founding father of Israel, then Rachel is considered to be the founding mother. And there's a story about her death in the book of Genesis chapter 35. Now, Jacob loves Rachel more than anybody else. You know, he's he's got four wives. He's got a bunch of kids and, you know, he's not the greatest of guys, but he loves Rachel. Rachel is like his everything. And she gives birth to his last son. And while she's giving birth, she hemorrhages and basically bleeds to death. There's this agonizing point where she has a conversation with her midwife. And she says, are we both going to survive? And the midwife says, your son will live, but you will die. And she says, okay. And as she's giving birth, she starts crying and she starts weeping because she knows that as soon as the baby's born, it'll be the end of her life. And so she's weeping as she's bringing this baby into the world. And finally, the son is born and the midwife tells her, you have a son. And she says, call him Benoni, which means in Hebrew, the son of my agony. And then she dies. And Jacob can't bear having a child named after something that would remind him permanently of the loss of the thing he loved most. And so he calls him Benjamin or Benjamin, which is now translated in our English Bibles, which means the son of my right hand. That's the story of Rachel's death. And where was it that Rachel died? Rachel died in Ramah, which is right outside the walls of the city of Bethlehem. And so what Jeremiah is doing in depicting Rachel weeping in her tomb over the Israelites as they're being carried off into Babylon, he's using very poetic language to kind of explain that that is the grievance of the nation. That is the grieving of the earth. That is the grieving of the people of God, of the children of God, looking in this world of suffering. Interesting. Jeremiah says, in this terrible situation, there is still hope because God is still here. So while all around is pain and while all around is weeping, we do not lose hope. And then interestingly enough, Matthew picks up the same story and Matthew brings us into the situation and invites us to once again consider this tragedy in the same viewpoint through the same eyes. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy. There is weeping that is going on. And it's the weeping, not just of these mothers and of these children, but it is the weeping of the nation, of all God's people on this earth who long for goodness and righteousness to be done. And it's the weeping of God himself in all of this, who looks at this pain and the suffering of the human condition, and he grieves over it because this is not the way that things were meant to be. This was not the way he made the world to be. He did not make this world to include suffering and death and pain and people turning on each other in their own selfish ways. And yet, even as he's there grieving with all of those who grieve, still there is hope. And Paul picks up this very beautiful metaphor as well. And Paul brings it to a very, very crystallized finishing in the book of Romans chapter 8. Could I ask you to flip to Romans chapter 8 and read us verse 18 through 26? Because I really think that will help to encapsulate this particular part for us. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature 
was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, notice the metaphors that Paul uses here too. I love this. Paul uses the metaphor of weeping, of groaning, and groaning in childbirth. He's using these same metaphors, and he's talking about how we have received hope because of the salvation of Jesus. And yet, this world is still dark, and yet we are still in this world of pain, and there's evil going around, there's tragedies going around everywhere. And he says, well, what's happened? Has Jesus come and left, and now we're left here on our own? He says, no, his spirit is with us. His spirit is here in this world. His spirit is weeping along with us, groaning along with us. And we look at this world and we are grieved. He says that creation itself is grieved. God himself is grieved at this. He says, but that's not the end of the story. I reckon, and the word reckon means that through everything I've been through, everything I've struggled with, this is a conclusion I've come to. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And he says, we don't see that now. We don't see that. He says, it won't be hope if we see it. We don't hope in the things which we see. But he says, just because we don't see it does not mean that it is not happening. God will work his will in this world. God will redeem this world. God has brought salvation into it through Jesus, and he has brought us into his kingdom through the adoption of sonship. And so where is he in the midst of times where it's bad? Where is he in the midst of suffering and pain? Right there along with us, grieving with us, paining with us, groaning with right. us. His spirit is there. But yet, that's not the end of the story. There is hope. There is salvation because that redemption has come. And one day our hope will be reality. And I just want to mention one thing about that beautiful phrase, the tears of Rachel. The phrase, the tears of Rachel, is only used in four places in the Bible. Only four places in the Bible. The actual story of the death of Rachel the destruction of Jerusalem, where Jeremiah makes the prophecy, at this point of the story, when the innocents are slaughtered, and the fourth place that that expression is used is Jesus on his way to Calvary. And the reason why it's used there is because that is what the gospel writer is saying. That is the ultimate Rachel in childbirth, dying so that her children may live. That is the ultimate thing that dries the tears of Rachel. When the creator, the one who gives life, comes in and dies in order that other people, the ones that are his children, the one that he that they has born, will live eternally. And so that's a very, very, very powerful statement of hope. Yes. And so in this mess that's going on, you're reading this, you're like, what's God doing in this story? Matthew asks you to pull away and say, this is what's, this is what's happening. God is still active and present in this. That's right. But there's still something else that has to happen. There's still one other part that we need to learn about. So can you go back to Matthew chapter 2 and read verse 19 to 23 for us? But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, 
Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so now something pretty interesting happens. Finally, it looks like they catch their big break, as we said earlier. And then as they're on their way back to Bethlehem, they hear that Archelaus is now king and he's just as violent and murderous as his father. So Joseph is warned of a dream and he's got to go back to Nazareth. And Once again, like we said, they go to Nazareth and in Nazareth, it's a complete mess because Nazareth is kind of like you know, it's this godforsaken podunk little town. Like you get it, you get an experience later on in one of the gospels where Nathaniel hears about Jesus being Jesus from Nazareth. His response is Nazareth. Seriously, can anything good come from Nazareth? So when they called Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, it wasn't a complimentary term. It was almost like a derogatory slur. It's like, it's this Jesus who's come from Nazareth. He's come from that that small little backwards village where nobody intelligent has come That's from. Right. They're, they're like the, the fools of society. And this is where Jesus has come from. And not only is he from that particular village and grow up in that village that is considered to be the outcasts, but he was an outcast of that particular village. He says it later. That's the one place he was never accepted. Right. So he was not only from the most backward place in that world at that time, but he was an outcast of that very community. Right. And he grew up with suspicion. He grew up with gossip. He grew up being shamed. And he grew up afterwards, everywhere he went, people would hear he's from Nazareth and they would think not take him seriously. That's right. This is God's son. What's the point of that? Why couldn't God just allow them to be in Bethlehem? At least that would have been okay. Why did he have to send them back to this backward place where they would be the scorn of all Israel and where he would even be a, an outcast in that particular place? Matthew says this is the fulfillment of all the prophets. And in the, all the prophets, it says that he should be called a Nazarene. Yes. So now you do a Bible search and you say, okay, which prophet says Jesus is and that will be a Nazarene? Nowhere. Interestingly enough, nowhere. There's not one place in the prophets of the Old Testament that says he will be born a Nazarene. That's right. So people initially thought that, okay, so maybe this was from some book that got missed out. It was a very intelligent Bible scholar who was way more wise than I that kind of posited a very interesting theory. And once he posited that, suddenly everything made sense. And so this is the general view that people take today. What Matthew is doing over here, he is doing a wordplay. In all the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah, about the coming king, they would call him a very, they give him a very interesting name. They would say that he was a stick. Mm. They would say that he was a branch. Now, why would they say that? Because they saw God's family as this great big tree. They saw the story of Israel as this big tree. And that illustration of the tree is used in multiple places across all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, across all the minor prophets as well. They always talked about the nation of Israel as this tree. And a lot of times they talk about the tree being cut down. But then when the prophecy of the Messiah comes in, they always say that he is a he is a branch. That's right. He is a twig. He is a new shoot that grows out of that fallen tree, that fallen line of Israel, that fallen kingly line of David, which has been completely knocked down. Out of that, hope springs forth. And so this is the word that they start using. And we can see this in, I'll just give you one reference, Isaiah chapter 11. It says that a... A shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight 
in the fear of the Lord. So they continually use this metaphor of stick, of branch, of twig, of the new growth out of the old dead tree. Yes. What is the the Hebrew word for stick, for branch? The Hebrew word for stick or branch is the word nutsar. Okay. It's where the word Nazareth comes from. Wow. And so by Matthew pulling up this thing and saying, this is what it was fulfilled when it said that he would be called a Nazarene. What he's saying is, is that you think Jesus lives in, 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 you know, as an outcast in this faraway place where no one knows, where no one cares. That's the fulfillment of the prophecy. That is him being the stick. That is him being the branch. He's not going to be coming in like a great big mighty tree that everybody can see. He's not going to be growing directly out of Jerusalem in the palace. Obviously, the small shoot will be growing somewhere else and growing in a place where you least expect it. And Isaiah himself prophesied this in one of the most powerful prophecies that we have about the Messiah. And it was in this prophecy that Isaiah outlined exactly what the Messiah was going to be. Because everyone was expecting this great, powerful, conquering king coming in to wrest the world from the controls of the evil and to make everybody pay for all the things they had done wrong and to establish Israel as the chief nation among all. But not to the prophecy of Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, a very different portrait of this Messiah is brought about. And he's not portrayed as the conquering king, but as the suffering servant. I would ask you to read this, please. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 5. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What is Isaiah saying? What is Matthew saying? What is the whole story of the scriptures trying to say? Where is God in all these moments where life goes wrong? Where was Jesus in all these moments when life was going wrong? Right. Right there in the middle of it. Right there in the middle of it. Yes. Through all of Jesus' life, he was there through everything that happened, living the human experience. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points as we were. Yes. Yet without sin. He experienced everything that we went through. That's right. You know, there's a very common saying these days that you can't tell anybody to do anything unless you know what they're going through. You cannot relate to anybody unless you have been in that same place. You cannot look at anyone and say, I understand you, I care for you, I love you, unless you yourself have gone through that. That's the very prevalent feel in the world today. We look at this, these stories of Jesus, we look at the stories of his life and we say, God, like most people say, you know, God, where are you? You live a pretty sheltered life where you're not really involved with all these things that go on in the world. What gives you the right to get involved with anything? What do these stories show? He was there in everything. So that way he could be the deliverer and he could be our salvation. Yes, praise God. And there's a beautiful story that I'll close with. I don't know who wrote it, but I came across it some time back. I love it. And so I'll just read it here and then we'll close on that. 
So it says, at the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's thrones. Some of the group near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame before God's throne, but with bitter diligence. How can God judge us? How can he know about sufferings? Snapped a brunette woman, jerking back her sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, we endured beatings, we endured torture, and we endured death. In another group, an African man lowered his collar. What about this, he demanded, showing the rope burns on his neck. I was lynched for no other crime than of being of a different race. We suffered in slave ships, and we've been wrenched from our loved ones, and we worked until death gave us release. And there were hundreds of these groups visible across the plain. Each had a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he permitted in this world. How lucky God was, they all seemed to agree. Able to live in heaven where all is sweetness and light without weeping or fear or hunger or hatred. Indeed, what on earth does God know about man? And what does he know about being forced to endure the trials of life? After all, God leads a pretty sheltered life. And so each group sent out a leader chosen because he had suffered the most. There was a Jewish person from Auschwitz. There was an African who had been sold into slavery. There was an untouchable from India. There was a person who was illegitimate. There was a person who survived Hiroshima. And there were others who had tasted life's bitterest dregs. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was really quite simple. Before God would be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they endured. And their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. But because he was God, they would set certain safeguards to be sure he would not use his divine powers to help himself. This was the list that they prepared. Let him be born of an oppressed race under the oppression of terrible leaders. Let the legitimacy of his birth forever be questioned. Let the threat of death always be upon him and let him never be accepted by society. Let him champion a cause so just, but so radical, it brings upon him the hate and condemnation and destructive attacks of political and religious authorities. Let him be inducted on false charges, tried before a prejudiced jury, and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him see what it's like to be terribly alone and completely abandoned by every living being and even his closest friends betraying him. Let him be tortured in a way that would be considered almost inhuman and let him die in the worst possible way. But let that death be humiliating and public and let it be amongst common criminals while they jeer at him and spit at him and mock him. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, it was met with murmurs of loud approval from the great throng of people. But suddenly, as the last one finished pronouncing his sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. Nobody moved. For suddenly, all realized the stark reality. God had already served his sentence. Inspiring you to draw closer to God, you're listening to Nightlight. Nightlight. And so what is the message that Matthew gives to us from this? What is the hope in our world? Where do we turn to when life starts going wrong? We feel like life's gone off the tracks and we start feeling that God has left us and abandoned us. Matthew wants us to see that God is right there with us in the midst of the most difficult things in our lives. He knows he's been there. He's gone through it. He suffered it. And he did it all so that way one day he could bring you hope. That one day he could wipe your tears. That one day through his death, you would forever have life. And you would forever have hope in that what was coming 
would be so much better that the struggles of this present time are not worthy to be compared with it. But while we don't see it now, we can hope. And the reason we can hope in it is because he went through it for us. And he left us his promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us and that he would be with us until the very end of the world. And so as I leave all of you now, I want to ask every one of you who are in a difficult time at this moment, look to him because he's been there. Reach to him because he is there and know that he will carry you through and one day bring the hope the hope that was promised and the hope that he died and rose again for, he will bring that into reality in your life and in the lives of everyone here on this earth. And thank you so much, David Karan, for that class, which he titled, Where is God When Life Goes Wrong? And I think it was very timely for the world this Christmas when it seems that there's just so much going wrong. But we can be assured that everything is under God's complete control. Well, that's it for now. We still have two more Christmas shows to share with you between now and Christmas. So I look forward to being back with you very soon for another Nightlight podcast. God bless you with a very happy and meaningful Christmas. Bye for now.